Hi, I'm Barry Gilreath, host of Fabric of Family. Thank you for joining us for this program today. We have a great lineup, so stay with us and we'll be back in just a moment. In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. Well, we've got a great lineup for our panel today. Kevin Tackett of Chatsworth, Georgia will be with us, as well as Charles Cochran of East Ridge, Tennessee. We're going to be talking about uh, death and dying and, and how we can help our children to understand uh, what can be a, a very difficult concept for children to sometimes comprehend. We're going to be talking about that today in our program, but before we go over to our panel discussion, Jim Merle is going to be uh, delivering a short segment for us. So let's listen to Jim at this time. Jim? Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto have you ever been in a position where you did what was exactly right in the sight of God? I mean by that, the choices that you had to make in life, those were the things that you found in God's Word. Those were things such as those that are upholding you to great moral standards. For example, let's take a mother on one occasion who looks at her daughter and sees her daughter or perhaps even a son, but sees them in a position where they ought not be. Maybe sees them involved in a relationship, maybe with a boyfriend or girlfriend, or maybe a husband or wife, and says, you know, they really ought not to be in that position. Maybe, for example, they're in a bad relationship where that person is not helping them go to heaven but causing them to fall. Or maybe they're in a position, if it be a marriage, where they're simply living in an adulterous situation which God cannot ordain, nor will He give the authority for them to remain therein. Then that parent has to step in. They have to stand up and instruct that child, this is somewhere you ought not be. This is somewhere where you can't remain. And what often happens then? Well, in that situation and many others, that child may become angry. They may look to that parent and say, you need to stay out of my business. You need to go and do whatever you have to do. Keep your nose to yourself, that sort of thing. And you know, oftentimes the downfall in that is that they continue to antagonize that person who tried to correct them. They continue to look to them and, and tell them they have no business in this or that. But, you know, when you're doing right in life, when you're doing exactly what God says, regardless of the pain that could come from that, you have to understand you're doing the best thing that you can. As a matter of fact, we learn several things throughout the scriptures, such as that which tells us to be not weary in well-doing. Likewise, we learn from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, to be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, watch this, in the work of the Lord, for your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What does that teach us? What it teaches us is this, when you're doing what's right, regardless of the downfall of that, regardless of what you take in from that, the persecution or tribulation which you may become involved, when you're doing what is right in the sight of God, you're doing the only thing that you can. When you're upholding not the morals of men, not the standards of men, but the morals and the standards of God, regardless of how that seems to work out this side of eternity, you're going to be blessed yonder side simply for doing what's right. And so I encourage you, as the Apostle Paul did, the Thessalonians, be not weary in well-doing. Understand what you do in life is not in vain if it's done in the Lord. That is by the Lord's authority. And I'll assure you this, when you do that, you'll eventually find your fortunes in faith. Thank you for joining us for our panel discussion today and uh, I'm very uh, thankful to have with me uh, Charles Cochran from the uh, East Ridge Church of Christ in uh, East Ridge, uh, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles is someone whom I have known for a number of years and I'm just very thankful that, that he is able to be with us today and uh, East Ridge Congregation is one of our supporting congregations for this mm -hmm. work. Appreciate the good work they're doing. Charles, uh, I'm going to introduce our other guests in just a moment, but let me uh, just give you a moment to uh, introduce yourself to those who are watching today. Anything you would want to tell us about, uh, your family, your work, mm -hmm. anything that, that comes to mind. Well, Barry, it's good to be with you, and thank you again for the opportunity and honor of being on this program. Uh, we've been with East Ridge Church 31 years, and uh, my wife and I are blessed with three children, three grandchildren, and uh, we're just... Uh, thrilled to be a part of that work there and they've been a great encouragement to me and um, it's just good to be with you today on the program. 
Well, Charles, it's good to have you. And sitting beside you, Charles, is Kevin Tackett. And Kevin's been with us before in previous yeah, programming. Absolutely. And uh, Kevin preaches for the Woodhaven Church of Christ in Chatsworth, Georgia. Uh, Kevin, um, what's going on with Woodhaven uh, recently? Any, any news, anything you want to share? Good Just morning. always growing, promoting the gospel, um, spreading the word, yeah. trying to uh, preach the word in North Georgia. Appreciate the opportunity to be um, uh, with the group with uh, Charles. Uh, Charles was the first gospel preacher I heard back 28 years ago. Mm. So I'm um, glad to share the couch with Charles today. Well, it's, it's great, great to have both of you with us. And we're, we've got a, a, a topic that is one that it's not pleasant to talk about but it is a topic that needs to be talked about because there are a lot of parents who uh, face the dilemma of, of how to talk to their children about something as uh, sensitive as death mm -hmm. and dying and unfortunately sometimes even a child is faced with this very young in their life where mm -hmm. someone they love dies and and so a parent needs to be prepared and uh, and to prepare the child for what is just as natural I suppose as life itself and that is dying but why do you think that some parents really avoid ever talking about this subject well I think it uh, has a lot to do with fear and especially that the parents are not comfortable with their own understanding of death and dying as well. It's a subject that nobody's ever gone and come back to explain to us what it's like, you understand? So it's something that we all have to speculate on what the other side is like. And it may, uh, leaning on our own understanding may be a little uncomfortable for us because it's something that we're not 100% comfortable with and in, in dealing with ourselves. Coming to terms with our own mortality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, what about the, this idea of uh, perhaps fear? Do you, do you think that sometimes maybe a parent just doesn't want to frighten a child, Charles? Mm -hmm. I think so, Barry. I, I remember the first time I had to deal with this with a little child, um, his mother died, and the grandmother called me and said, would you come and tell um, this little child, my grandchild, of the death of his mother and I go as a minister and you, you know you go as uh, a bit of fear of not saying the wrong thing exactly. you don't want to say something that will create more fear or will create more grief or more struggles for that child so you go with a lot of uh, trepidation and a lot of fear on our part of saying something that will be out of place or will cause more grief for that little child and sometimes the best thing you can do, Barry, is go with the attitude of not trying to say too much. If you're trying to say too much, then you're going to maybe say some things that may be a little more difficult for the child to understand. Well, do you think that it's a positive thing for parents to even talk about this subject, you know, uh, mm -hmm. prior to uh, the, the so. child experiencing a loss in their life? Or do you think it's better just to uh, wait until that time comes? No, I think in all things, and, it's, and death and dying is a, is a life subject, so therefore it makes it a biblical subject, and it's something that we need to expose our children to. Death is, death is a part of life, if you want to look at it that way. It's a process of, of going on into the eternity, you know, into the eternal. So it's, it's a phase, if you will, of life that we go th through from this life to the next, and it's something that we all must face eventually. So to reserve or to hold that from a child, you, it would um, be hard to deal with when they have to face it. Mm. But if yeah. they know that it's coming and have an understanding that it's coming and what it is, um, it gives them a better understanding of that. I know um, my, my son lost his mom at 14 mm -hmm. and uh, she went through a five year battle with cancer and understanding that phase helped, I don't want to say soften the blow, but uh, definitely helped him come to terms with death and dying. You know, over in the Old Testament, there is uh, a section of scripture, and I'm referencing Deuteronomy chapter 11. In fact, uh, Kevin, if, if you don't mind, just go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 to 20. Um, because here is a, a section of scripture in the Old Testament where God is instructing his children, his people, uh, to, to educate, to train 
their children. And this is a passage that has application to, you know, teaching whatever subject to our children. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I just wonder whether it would also have application maybe to what, what we're talking about today. Sure. Kevin, go ahead and read that. Therefore you shall lay up your words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them up as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's very beneficial to take things that are just simply going on around the child at that point in time in their life. Um, maybe something like a, a pet. A pet passes away. That's a very tragic loss for a child. Uh, that might be a good way uh, mm -hmm. to, to at least uh, start the discussion about, uh, about life and, and, and helping the child to understand about these losses. What are your thoughts about that? I think that's a good uh, point, uh, Barry, that when you have a pet, you have love and you share love with that little pet. And little children especially mm -hmm. have a connection that we adults maybe don't always have. We have a connection, but maybe not in the same way as a little child. So we've had situations in our family where we've lost some pets and the children cried about it and we talked about it and the love that you shared. So the little things in life that maybe we take for granted sometimes, Barry, like you said, the little practical illustrations of love and the loss of love and what we learn from that and how we can grow from it, I think is a good example, good lesson for us. What are some signs that I as a parent might look uh, to in my, my child's life that would uh, tend to suggest that, that my child is struggling with this. Uh, and of course we know that anytime you experience a loss there's going to be some, some struggle, mm -hmm. but, but that the child's really having a tough time and needs some extra assistance in, in coping with this loss. Well, we, we categorize them psychologically. There's stages uh, of a grief process and we can categorize those. But mainly with children, isolation tends to be the very first one that I see. Children drawing away, um, reserving themselves. And, and you see this a lot um, when the child, especially when you're talking about a, uh, an adolescent or a teenager, they like to uh, draw away and be on their own. And um, you start seeing that idea of isolation. And of course, anger and aggression acting out, which would be unnatural, you know. Um, becoming angry for the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. those, those are some things that you can see in children, especially in the first uh, stages of, uh, of the loss of a, like you said, even a pet. I, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I can see children getting upset uh, when, at the loss of a pet and just not knowing how to deal with the emotion of loss. And maybe even the idea of um, where they at night, they don't want to go to bed, they're afraid, they don't want to be alone. Maybe at night they want to be with mom and dad or with someone that they feel secure with. So the fact that maybe there's that relationship of clinging mm. to a parent uh, in the loss of someone that you love. And so you can pick up on that uh, clinging or that fact that they don't want to go uh, in the darkness alone or whatever. Well, gentlemen, this is a good discussion. We're about halfway through the time that we have allotted for this segment today. But we're going to take a break at this time and uh, we're going to watch another segment, a segment uh, with a young man by the name of Harrison Chastain. He's going to talk about making wise choices and he's going to be talking about church attendance and youth and the importance of it. And so we're going to watch that and then we'll come back and we'll finish our discussion. The George Barna Research Foundation has done many surveys throughout the years and they've done several on the idea that teenagers leave the church. And then the last one that they did on this topic, the research showed that 75% of teenagers leave the church after graduating high school. That's three out of every four. Why is that? Why is it that three out of four teenagers leave the church when they graduate high school. Some people have suggested that the church isn't fun enough. They don't do enough 
fun stuff to keep the young people coming to church. And that may be partly true, but I believe it has a deeper reason. I believe that three out of four teenagers do not come to church after they graduate high school because they never take seriously the idea that they must develop a faith of their own. They're used to piggybacking off of mom and dad's faith, off of their preacher's faith, off of their youth minister's faith, off of their older brother or sister's faith or their grandparents' faith, but it's never really theirs. And when it comes time for us young people to move off to college, when it comes for us to experience the real world and to experience what life will throw at us, and mom and dad are no longer over our backs to get us out of bed and go to church, we have a decision to make. Will we go to church or not? It's very important that we realize that church attendance was established very early. The, the importance of coming to church was established from a very, very early point. The early church in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the church was first established, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 in verse 46 that they, meaning the church, continued daily in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And they did this with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now, let's take a step back for just a second and realize that the church in the first century, they had jobs. The people in the first century had jobs. They were fishermen. They were tent makers. They were carpenters. They worked hard for their living. Don't you think that if they worked that hard that it would be hard for them to go to church every single day? We're given to believe in verse 46 that the church met every single day. Don't you think that it was hard after a long day of, at the carpentry shop, a long day after making a tent, a long day after fishing? You've been out on the river all day long trying to fish for your living and trying to fish for your food. Don't you think that after a long, hard day at work that it was hard to go to church? Absolutely, positively, yes, it was. And we often find ourselves, myself included sometimes, we find ourselves complaining. Oh, I got to go to church on Sunday or... Oh, I got to go, go to church on Wednesday. We only go three times a week. But the early church met every single day, and we, yet we still find ourselves complaining about going to worship God. Notice also what the verse says, Acts 2 verse 46, that they did this with gladness and simplicity of heart. The church was happy to meet every day. Sure, it must have been hard for them to meet every single day, but they did it gladly. And a lot of times when we go to church three times a week. We don't go gladly. We had so much fun last Saturday night going to Nashville, going to Opry Mills, going to Huntsville, going to Bridge Street, going to Parkway Place, going shopping and seeing a movie with our friends. And then we complain about going to church. Or we have something better to do on Wednesday night. Let's go fishing on Wednesday night instead of going to church. But we see the early church never did that. The early church never decided, I'm going to do something else. Something else is more important than my time in the house of God. Psalm chapter 122 and verse 1, the Bible there says, David writing here, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, Come, let us go to the house of the Lord. Young people, can the same be said of us? That when it's time, when that alarm clock goes off on Sunday morning, can we truly say, I was glad when my alarm clock went off so I could go to the house of the Lord. We're back with uh, Charles Cochran and Kevin Tackett, our guests today. We're talking about uh, children and when they lose a loved one and, and how parents can, can help that child to understand the process of grief that they're going through. Charles, I want to uh, begin with you in this segment and uh, I want to raise a question here and see what your thoughts are about this as far as the fears that sometimes children may have when someone they love dies. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the, the concerns or fears that mm -hmm. children experience? There may be one thing that they struggle with is that they've done something wrong. And if they feel like, well, I've done something wrong to cause my loved one, mom or dad or grandmother, grandfather to get sick or to pass on. And, and that not understanding, it's not something that you've done to cause this. Little children, are corrected for misdeeds and things that are problems. And sometimes maybe they think, well, I lost my loved one because I'm being punished for something that I've mm -hmm. done. So 
So that fear so it's, is it's real important, I guess, that their other parent or uh, you know right. adult in their life uh, sits down and and reassures them That's about right. that. And that reassurance is so important that uh, they they understand it's not your fault, and you shouldn't feel that something has happened to your loved one because of you. Kevin, what about you? What's another thought? Well, and in, in, in conjunction with that is the understanding, we use very polite terms, well, they went away. And the children perceive that as they've gone to a physical place, like across the street or something, and when are they coming back? It's, and it's a difficult topic to sit down and say, well, they're not coming back here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, it can get very complicated as the children get older. Um, dealing with the fact that they can understand the difference between salvation and not and understanding the concept of eternity and where they'll be in eternity and and that that's a that's a different uh, topic altogether but um, but just reassuring the child that 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 they're okay the mm -hmm. child's okay that's what I mean is that the child is okay and that the child has done nothing to cause the, the, the loved one to leave. Because mm -hmm. just like um, Charles has said, sometimes they bear a portion of guilt on that, like they may have caused them to go away, something they may have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think another thing very quickly, Barry, is that we always want to be sure that we not say to them, God wanted your loved one. God Absolutely. took your loved one to heaven or to wherever that that person in the child's mind is gone. And now, they, what might that suggest to the child? I think it might create a fear of God. Well, God took my loved one, and was God going to come and take me? Uh, we, we say even as adults that it would not be the best way in counseling or working with people who are grieving to just say, well, God wanted this person in heaven with him. It leaves an attitude or a thought that God is the one directly involved with this, uh, with the death of, of your loved one. So be careful about saying that to a child. How do you think our approach should change, if any at all, when you're talking about maybe a, a child that's, uh, you know, five or six or seven years old versus mm -hmm. uh, maybe a child who is a teenager? As the child gets older, and speaking from experience on this, they understand the concept of death. Where a younger child, a a you know preschool age, four to five year old, as you were saying, may not understand what death and dying is. You get into the more adolescent age; they understand what death is, what it is to die. Their questions run far deeper. Now we're talking about things about where did they go, as in heaven or hell, and and what is eternity, and will I ever see them again? And it's more. It's on a deeper level. It's on a deeper understanding, of course, as, as we go through life. You know, we just comprehend things on deeper levels. Um, and, and your approach has to be a little bit more uh, respectful, um, a little bit more mature. I guess it, as the older the child gets, the, uh, the understanding that they have, we have to treat them as, I guess, more as young adults in that matter. Mm. Now, I want to go back to something Charlie said at the beginning of our discussion. He said that, um, you know, he had had an occasion where he had to uh, to sit down and talk with a, a child about the fact that uh, the child's mother had uh, passed away. I'm just kind of curious, Charlie, um, how you handled that mm -hmm. situation then, and do you uh, believe, you know, that, that you handled that in the right way, or is there anything mm -hmm. you would have done differently having uh, gone through that experience mm -hmm. yourself? Barry, I guess we all struggle with wanting to go back and redo things if we learn how to handle things better. Probably when I went into that house and sat down with that little boy, the grandmother, the mother of the lady who had passed away, uh, I just sat on the couch beside the little boy and just plainly said something to the effect that your mother got sick and she, she died. And, and she's not going to be able to come back and be with you. Um, and you don't really know, Barry, anything else to say. You've got to say it, I think like Kevin said, truthfully, without going into a lot of detail and 
describing you know the situation about death but you've got to let them know up front uh, and as kindly and lovingly and gently that um, you know and, and she knew her his mother had been sick she knew he knew that she had been struggling and so it wasn't something maybe that was unexpected or sudden mm -hmm. but at the same time um, the only way I knew how to handle it was as briefly as forthrightly and yet as kindly and gently and, let, mm -hmm. and he cried let him cry put your arm around Absolutely. him and say we love you your grandmother loves you mm -hmm. you're not alone and um, there are people here that will be here for you and I think that's struggles. one reason Charles and uh, Kevin that we as parents sometimes avoid this topic because we don't want our children to be fearful we don't want our children to be sad we want them to be happy mm -hmm. um, but but nevertheless it is a topic that you mm -hmm. can't be here long on this earth before you're going to have to deal with it in exactly. some form or fashion that child is and mm -hmm. and and so I think it is good that we're talking about this today and uh, Kevin I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this we just got about a minute left but um, is there an appropriate time that a child should grieve I mean is it you know two weeks three months I mean uh, it's, it's a fingerprint that's a nice way to say grief in the way not just a child but the way even adults handle grief is like a fingerprint everyone is unique and you can't set a timeline on something um, circumstances may, mm -hmm. may cause it to be something that you've expected and your grief, your grief from the time of loss, you know, the dying process may be longer than the death process itself and your time of grief may be shorter than someone who had an unexpected loss. Um, children are so unique um, in, their, in their behaviors, in their, in their attitudes and such and their, their grief will be as equally yeah. as unique. Well, gentlemen, our time is up, but I want to thank both of you for helping us to talk about a very important topic today, and hopefully we've helped someone who's watching. So. Well, that's all the time that we have for our program today, but we do hope that our program has been beneficial to you and your family. Fabric of Family is brought to you by the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, and also in association with the work of a number of other congregations whom are going to be uh, scrolling uh, down the screen in just a moment. We hope that you'll take time to visit with one of our supporting congregations if you're in their area or a Church of Christ in your own home area. Until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath, your host, wishing you and your family a wonderful day.